a lot of time, but most importantly, we come together this morning to praise and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Todd, could you leave some word of prayer, please? I'll join me this morning. Lord, as I get up this morning and seeing uh, your creation at work again, the, the rain falling and the lap show that we got to see, Lord, I just uh, thank you for your your grace and mercy upon each one of us that are within earshot of us here today, Lord. Father, we come here, we uh, come to fellowship today to, to lift your name on high, as, as we do on every Sunday. And I, and I pray that every morning when we get up and we start our day, before our feet hit the floor, uh, with your name upon our lips, Lord, that you may guide us and direct us into what we're going to do uh, this upcoming week. Because uh, the walk that we have with you is 24-7. So we come here this morning, Lord. Uh, just asking your forgiveness when we failed to do your will, Lord, when we traveled down their own paths, and we failed to hear that knock upon our hearts that, where you want us to go. So today, uh, Lord, I just pray that we open our ears and our minds, and mainly our hearts, Lord, to invite your word that it is written upon our hearts that we may do and follow your will this day, Lord. Lift those up to you this morning that are spreading your word, Lord. <clears throat> They're talking about the gift of eternal life. Uh, and I don't know how else to say that. Through you, Lord, uh, we can come to that place, uh, that eternal place in heaven. So, Father, we just thank you and praise you. Uh, and we lift this time up to you in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Todd. I appreciate those prayers. I hope everybody's having a glorious morning this morning. We, uh, we got us a little rain last night. Uh, weatherman says we're going to get a little bit more, so that's it's kind of glorious. It's kind of neat here in Junction right now. Uh, football team didn't fare too well for homecoming, but that's okay. They played hard. Got a new homecoming queen and a homecoming king, I guess, so to speak. And hey, how about that band? The band looked pretty good. Everybody looked good. The chain gang guys were well, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, been reading from a book lately, and I just. Uh, I'm still kind of going there a little bit. It deals with making disciples of all men in Matthew. Just wondering today, I know the preachers are going to be out there today just preaching their hearts out. Telling everybody about God and Jesus Christ. But I hope that you take the word to the streets. I hope you're just not showing up there for about an hour today before you go eat at the restaurant and then go home and watch a football game. I hope today that whatever the word is, that you take it put it in your heart and take it to the streets and make disciples and continue to make disciples of all men and have a relationship with your friends and neighbors and let them see Jesus Christ in you. That's what it's all about. It's not about just going to church. It is about going to church. It is about being a body of Christ or a family member of the body of Christ. But it's also about sharing the word of Jesus Christ. It's not leaving it there. I'm just showing up for an hour and looking good. <clears throat> and just taking it out of the word, taking it out in the world and making disciples of all men as, as uh, as God has to do. I've got a little bit of a word afterwards. I'm going to let John speak first, and I may end up with something, but uh, pretty excited to have him back. He's been gone for a little while, and it's been a while since he's talked, and I'll get out of the way. I've got John Guerrero who's going to spread the word of God. Hi. Right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's very good to be back here. It's been a while since I've preached, so I might be a little bit rusty. Seven months away is kind of long for me. But the passage I'm going to be in this morning is found in Psalm 67. And I was reading over this just a few days ago and was thinking about how, how perfect it sounds, how, how ideal it sounds, that, that if we lived in a, in a perfect world, this would be completely easy to accomplish. Um, but the thing is, even though we don't live in a perfect world and we're not perfect people, we serve a perfect God who can very easily, through imperfect people such as us, bring about this ideal found in Psalm 67. And so I'm going to read to you just a couple of verses, Psalm 67, verses 2 through 4. And he says that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. And so like I said, it sounds wonderful. It sounds like, wouldn't we all love to have that? Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let all the nations in the world sing for joy and celebrate our Creator and our Redeemer. That, that God's ways and God's salvation would be known all across the world. But that's not always easy. To, it, it isn't always easy for us to, to accomplish that. 
Um, but like I said, the good thing is we serve a wonderful God who can easily bring that about if his people will submit to him and allow him to use us to do that. And so what I want to talk about this morning, very briefly, is about God's desire that he be glorified and known all across the world. That God's desire that his fame, that his name, that his, his wonders and his salvation be known all across the world. Not just in our local churches, not just in our local communities, but all across the world, even among people who don't even know him yet. That God has a desire that he himself be known and glorified all across the earth. It's a very simple truth, but it's not a, it's not a truth that is easy for us to, to realize and might not even be realized in our own lifetimes. However, it is something that God desires, and because it's something that God desires, it's something that we should put our hearts to and really pursue. The fact that God wants to be glorified is really an idea that's seen all throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, you see God leading his people, Israel, into battle over and over and over again and constantly giving them victory. Even when it seemed like they were about to fail, he allowed them to win those battles. And why did he do that? First of all, because he had a plan for them. But secondly, so that their enemies, the enemies of the people of God, could turn around and recognize that there was a greater power behind their, their, their forces, their, their work and their efforts. And that greater power was Jehovah, the God of the universe. And so those people will turn around and say, we believe that you serve the only true God. It's very obvious to us. And in that, God will receive more glory. Time and time again, he used his servants, his prophets, his ministers in the Old Testament to perform incredible works and miracles to serve people in such awesome ways that those people who witnessed those things and experienced them had no choice but to turn around and worship God. Because they knew that only a powerful God could do those things. In the New Testament, I remember when, when the, the disciples asked Jesus, Who sinned that this man was born blind? Was it his mother? Was it his father? Was it him? And Jesus said, It wasn't anyone that sinned. It wasn't anyone's fault. But so that God could receive the glory. And so Jesus made it very clear that sometimes bad things happen to people, not because of any fault of their own, but because God wants to receive glory in healing those people. And so Jesus went about proclaiming the glory of his Father, performing miracles and pointing people back to the Lord so that God himself could receive more glory. The Bible tells us in Revelation that one day the saints are going to worship around the throne of Jesus. We're going to throw our crowns at his feet. We're going to cry, worthy is the Lamb who is slain. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And in heaven we will be glorifying God all together as one family. And God will receive the glory. But not only is it something that God wants to receive one day in heaven, it's also something that God is, is wanting and desires of right now on this earth, in our lives, in our day and age. God wants to be glorified. And so if that's God's will, if, it, if it's God's desire that he receive more glory, then doesn't it make sense that God would do something to ensure that that actually happens? That God would do something to make sure that he gets that glory that he wants so badly. That if life is not about us, but it's really about God and God wants more glory, then wouldn't God do something to make sure that he gets that glory? And, and that's why God called unto himself a people for his own possession. A people who he set apart to go and, and make disciples, to go and, and spread the gospel, to go and do things and live in such a way that brings more glory to himself. And that people is us, the body of Christ, the church all around the world. And in its various expressions and forms, the church of Christ all across the world it, it has been charged with that mission. Go and glorify the Lord. Go and live in such a way that God receives that glory. But how is that done? How does God use his people to accomplish that purpose? And that's a, that's a question that I really want to answer as I look at some scriptures this morning. But I really want to focus on what the psalmist says here in Psalm 67 to really set that as a foundation. And then, and then turn around and, and ask, how does that happen? How are we responsible for that? How can we go about bringing more glory to the Father? If you look again at Psalm 67, starting in verse 2, he says that your way may be known on the earth. And the word way there is literally translated as journey or path. But figurative, figuratively, it also means your course of life or your manner of living. And so essentially, the psalmist is saying that God's desire is that his manner of life or the God way of living be known all across the world. And how can that happen unless God's people are living that God way? Unless God's people are really living in such a way that we represent God to the world. That's the only way that they're going to see and know what God's manner of life really is. Next in that verse, he says that your salvation may be known among all nations. 
Your salvation among all the nations. And that word salvation is a, is a rescue, a deliverance. But also, we can look at it as in God doesn't only want his act of salvation or his ability to save to be known, but he also wants his method of salvation, the Messiah, to be known among all the nations. And that's a pretty, uh, pretty significant influence for world missions, to go out and take the gospel to the world so that Jesus Christ can be known among all nations. On top of that, not only are God's ways and saving power to be known, but he also says that the earth and all of its inhabitants and nations are to be glad and rejoice and celebrate and praise the Creator. And that happens when the challenge in verse 2 is made a reality. When God's ways, when His saving power are known all across the world, then the nations can be glad and the people can rejoice. And only when God's ways and salvation, His saving power, are really known. When the world hears about and comes to know God's ways and His saving power, when they respond to that knowledge, when they hear it, when they believe it, and when they respond to it and allow, them to, allow that to change them, then there's a reason for them to really celebrate and worship the Creator. Because the nations and the people of earth can only be glad and they can only rejoice and celebrate God when they truly come to know Him and His salvation. When they truly come to know His saving power. Another translation says it there in verse, in verse 2, let His saving power be known. When they truly come to know God in those ways, that's when the nations can really be glad. And so again, the question is, how is God glorified? How does he bring that about? How does it actually happen? And so if we know from this psalm, Psalm 67, that God wants his ways, his saving power to be known all across the world. If we know that God's desire is that the nations be glad and sing for joy, that the nations rejoice, that they know God, then how does God ensure that that actually happens? And the answer is us. God's people. God uses us to ensure that his glory is known all across the world, that he receives more glory among the nations of the world. The Bible makes it very clear that God's people are really his chosen instruments. Not that we have any inherent value or worth of our own, but God chooses us. He uses us as instruments to go out into the world and to make him known, to make his name known all across the world. The earth. God's people and the people that they are in the way that they live are one of the means by which God chooses to spread his fame all across the world. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says this, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The chief end of man is to bring glory to the Father and enjoy him forever. And so our purpose, our, our chief purpose for being alive on this earth is to glorify God and, to, and in glorifying Him to really enjoy that relationship with Him forever. And Pastor John Piper says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. That when we find our satisfaction in God, then that satisfaction in God compels us to live in such a way that we glorify Him more. It compels us to live in such a way that we go out and represent Him and speak of Him and tell the world of Him and that brings Him more glory. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, a pretty familiar passage, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And this is very important. He says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so here we see a direct correlation, a relationship between the things that we do, the way that we live, and the amount of glory that God receives. That Jesus says, you go and you let your light shine. You show people who you belong to, and in that you bring more glory to the Father because people can see your good works. They can see the way that you're living. That God is glorified when we let our lights shine is very simple, a very clear a point that Jesus makes here in Scripture. You know, in the Old Testament days, God called unto himself a people for his own possession. That people was the nation of Israel. They didn't do anything to deserve that. They didn't do anything to, to, to be worthy of being God's chosen people. But God chose them for a reason. And God told Abraham, the father of what would become Israel, that through him and ultimately through his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It's a pretty bold statement. All the nations of the earth would be blessed. And one of the things that he meant by this was that through Israel's obedience to God, through their strong influence and presence on the earth, through their godly lifestyle, that the nations would be impacted in such a way that they would see a God that they didn't know before. And that's what happened so many times, except, of course, whenever Israel fell off the bandwagon and turned against God. But in those times when they were living right, 
people were able to see God through them. But perhaps the most significant and powerful way that God blessed the nations through Israel was by one day bringing through Abraham's lineage a Messiah, Jesus Christ. And eventually that Messiah would change the world. And that Messiah would, much like the Father did in the Old Testament, call unto himself a people for his own possession. And he would tell those people, just like God did in the Old Testament, and as the writer of Hebrews points out, he would say, I will be to you a God, and you will be to me a people. And he would make a covenant with them, just like he did in the Old Testament. And that covenant would be ratified by his blood on the cross. And that covenant would also a, a, include a mission. And the mission would be this, just like God told Abraham, go and bless the nations. And so Jesus would say to his people, who he had called unto himself, go and make disciples. Go and glorify me. Go and bless the nations and inspire them to know me even more. And in the words of the psalmist here in Psalm 67, let the nations be glad. Let, let his salvation and his ways be known all across the world. That's the mission that Christ gave to his church. And so God calls us to glorify him and to make him known all across the world. And we do that in so many different ways. But real quickly, I just want to point out three. Three very important ways that God calls us to let the, the, his glory, let his fame, let his name be spread all across the world. And number one is that we proclaim the gospel. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. God says <coughs> you've been chosen, you've been set apart. And why? For this purpose, so that you may proclaim his excellencies, the God who's called <coughs> you out of darkness and into light. And so God gives us a mission, a challenge. He says, go out and proclaim my name and what I've done for you. Go out and spread the message of salvation. Another way that we can bring more glory to God on this earth is that we can lead God-glorifying lives. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live, listen to this, sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The Bible calls us to live lives that represent our God, that live that God way that the psalmist talks about in Psalm 67. And then finally, we live with hope and expectation that something greater is coming. The world doesn't know that. The world doesn't live that way. But we have a hope that transcends this world, a hope that Jesus is coming, a hope that one day we're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. Amen. In Titus 2.13, he says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then in 1 Peter 1.13, Peter says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, and fix your hope on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we can live with a hope and an expectation that one day we'll be with Jesus. And that can shape our lives here on this earth. And so to wrap this up, God has called to himself a people for his own possession. And that people is us. God's called us to go out and be his instruments in the world to spread his gospel, to spread his name, and to bring him more glory. People need to know our Father. But the only way they can know him is if we represent him and speak of him. And when they know him, then what Psalm 67 and verse 4 says can be true. Let the nations be glad. Let the nations be blessed. Let them come to know the Father and be full of joy. And so God doesn't have to use us. He can do it any other way. But he chooses to. And so we need to, to submit ourselves to him, to submit our lives to him, and surrender Amen. our lives and our purpose in life to him. And remember that our God-given purpose is this, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Amen. Amen. Sorry it took us so long to get up here our toes <laughs> Good word, don't we?
Lord, being disciples of all men, being holy. That could be one place. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Last night I was listening to a word and it took us to John 3 and it talks about a man named Nicodemus. And let me read this for you. Start with John 3, 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher of pardon. No one can do these signs that you must do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, I say, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born by water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He was the king and the head of the Pharisees. He knew all, did all. He studied the word of God day in and day out. Should it be cool for him to get to heaven, shouldn't it? He's had in church every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We had Friday off, he ate fish. But it should be good for him to get to heaven, right? My question is to each and every one of us out there that sit in the church that truly don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, is it time to ask him into your heart and be saved today? So we can go out and make disciples of all men. <clears throat> so we can do the work that he's truly called us to do. Just because we're there every Sunday and Wednesday doesn't mean that we'll see eternal life with Jesus because there'll be a time when John said that he'll come back and there'll people be crying out saying, Lord, Lord, but he's going to say, I did not know you because we didn't ask him in our heart and we didn't have a relationship with him. Today's the day of Jesus Christ is calling you to ask him in. Today's the day. Ask him in. Ask him in to be your Lord. I've got Catherine going to come up here and pray for him to leave you there. Lord, you are holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Amen. And Father, you made us to worship you, Lord. We were made to worship you, Father, to worship you and give you glory. And so, Lord, today, this day, may all of those, Lord, that have a relationship with you, Father, that are living their lives, Lord, the way you taught us to, Father. May we worship you today, this day, Lord. May we have the desire, Lord, to worship you more than anything else in our lives. And so, Father, uh, your word uh, does not return void. It goes to the nations. And so, Father, today we pray for all of those, Lord, to the nations, Father, that do not know you, and Lord, only you can change a heart. And so, Father, we uh, speak out today to the nation, salvation, salvation, salvation. Amen. For the time is coming, Lord. It's, it's coming nearer, Father. And we need you, Lord, in our lives. We need the church to turn back, Father, and put our eyes on you. And so, Lord, uh, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord. And we are so grateful for our salvation. And we cry out today, Lord, and pray for those, Lord, for you to come into their hearts and live the life of victory, Lord. And we just thank you, Father, and we praise you and we give you glory, Lord, glory. We love you, Lord, and we ask this in your son's name, Yeshua HaMashiach, in his name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, that's in the You just had to bring up the scripture about the high and godliness, didn't you?